Hello, and welcome back to another video dedicated to Battlestar Galactica. I will be brief in this video because this one contains an extended interview with screenwriter and executive producer Tom DeSanto. In my previous video entitled Battlestar Galactica The Other Revival Attempts, which if you didn't see that video, you can click on the link below this video and see it on Vimeo.com. I revealed what DeSanto had in mind for his plans for a continuation project, in which he was working on with director Brian Singer. But in this case, you will be hearing from him in his own words. So without further ado, here it is. Enjoy. Well, I've heard this story about you and Brian Singer on the plane and, and you watching the DVD of the original series. What did it feel like when you actually walked into Universal's office, made your pitch, and then to hear them say yes as a fan? What, what did that feel like? Because we were both sort of flying back. Uh, we're both from New Jersey. We're flying back first class, paid for by the studio, <laughs> to New York to do the press junket and to uh, celebrate X-Men and... Um, I'm sitting there with Battlestar Galactica, um, and he looks over and he's like, "Ah, Battlestar Galactica." And we we talked about it, and he asked if he borrowed the DVD, which he did. And um, you know, he had as fond memories of it as, as I did, and you know, he was a fan, and we bonded over that. And um, you know, walking through the door at Universal with uh, with Brian Singer excited to do your project is <laughs> probably the best. 800 pound gorilla anybody could ask for so you know it was a it was a project which um very quickly we got uh, answers with uh, william morris acting as the the tip of the spear uh, we cut through a lot of the the bureaucracy at universal and when they finally said you know yes let's uh let's bring this thing out and feeling um we when we went in to uh, do the pitch i actually had to go home so Brian went at it uh, alone, but you know, pretty much by that time, they had seen the box office that X Men had done, and um, and Universal was was just excited to be in business together. And at first, they were sort of in disbelief. They were like, "You want to do what?" And we're like, "We want to do Battlestar Galactica." And they're, <laughs> they were sort of like, "Why?" Um, but one thing that uh, we you know we both went in with was was a passion for the show and. Uh, and uh, we got the, the doors open and we greased the wheels and something that had been stuck for 25 years, all of a sudden uh, the old girl started moving again. Well, you, you mentioned the, the reaction of the, uh, of the suits at Universal and, and certainly uh, that seems to be uh, a lot of the reaction uh, for Battlestar Galactica before it came back into the limelight. Do you, do you think there's people that, that just get it and people that just don't? Yeah, I, I really do. Well, I understand that in the beginning, you and Brian were actually thinking about a remake. What what changed your mind, if that is in fact true, and, and convinced you to go in the direction of a continuation? Well, it, it was uh, for me. It was never a question of a remake. Um, it was always going to be a continuation. Um, it was really about how far we were going to set it in the future, and whether it was going to be, be a continuation a la Star Trek Next Generation, which was going to be something completely different, you know, where everyone in the past was dead, and they were referenced, and you might have bones show up in the, the first episode, but that was it. But I think once, um, you know, once Brian saw the fan base out there, um, you know, he started to become convinced that it could be 25 years later, um, which was, you know, I think the best way to take the show. Uh, and, and fortunately, we had a, a good take uh, on the storyline and had a, had a handle on the characters. And, you know, being a fan of the show, I understood the soul of it, you know. And I know, I don't, um, there's no allusions to some of the cheesy episodes that were on because I'm in agreement that uh, there were some cheesy episodes uh, on that uh, original 78 series. No one would disagree with you about that. Absolutely. But there's also some of the, I think, the best science fiction um, ever done on television. You know, with, uh, you know, Lloyd Bridges um, and as Commander Kane, uh, you know, the, the Pegasus episodes um, were, were amazing stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, that uh, combined with um, the Count Ibley episodes with Patrick McNee, um, 
you know, War of the Gods was just it was it was it was wonderful, wonderful sci fi and that was the tone that had imprinted on me and that was the tone I wanted to translate to the new series. Well, we'd heard a lot about uh, the old friends who were returning, uh, Starbuck, as portrayed by Dirk Benedict, and, and Boomer, as portrayed by Herb Jefferson Jr., and Orrin, of course, a grown-up boxy. We haven't heard a whole lot about the new characters, though, that you were going to introduce. Can you talk a little bit about the, the new generation of hotshot pilots and new secondary characters and the balance you were going to uh, try to achieve between them? Sure, absolutely. There was, um, uh, and actually, one of the, the biggest, you know, uh, sort of, Amount of, from the largest amount of joy I got from from stepping into this project was to making those phone calls to either Dirk or Richard or or Herb um, and, or talking with uh, with Anne, you know, and, and saying, "Hey, look, you're not in going to be in the pilot, but I've got this thing mapped out for five years, and I want to bring you back at X point." And look, the first day we were open, um, Dan Angel uh, got a phone call from Jane Seymour and said, hey, look, I know I was killed off in the original series, but, um, you know, I would love to come back and explore that character, and if there was anything for me, let you know uh, that I'm open to that. Um, and I thought that was pretty wonderful. You know, Jane's gone on to tremendous success, and for her to say, look, I think I got a little bit um, a little bit more to explore with, with that character is, is something pretty amazing. No, um, that would have been a fan dream come true to, to see that episode. Yeah, and, you know, there were storylines mapped out, uh, which included her character. And um, But, yeah, going back to your original question about uh, new characters, again, it was looking into um, Boxy, sort of becoming an adult and sort of <laughs> coming to hate the name Boxy. So, um, originally, I wanted to call him Orion, um, and Brian felt that was a little bit, uh, you know, two on the nose. So we came to a compromise, and it was called Oren. Uh, and basically, what he was was he was Ahab without the whale. And at this time, the direction we were going to take Galactica was still following with the storyline of the so it's you know the colonials fleeing, looking for Earth, being pursued by the Cylons. But what if the Cylons stopped? Just all of a sudden, stopped chasing. There was a there, we planned to have a final battle which happened 20-something years ago, uh, in which several of the characters were lost, including Apollo, including uh, the Pegasus was lost again. Um, but then it was it. It was a great battle, and there's no word from the Cylons for a month, for two months, for six months, for a year. And all of a sudden, they come across this massive asteroid belt, and it's rich in gold and ice and all the raw materials they need to survive and also to give them a sense that they could hide amongst this sort of great desert, as it were. So the template we were using, what if the you know, Israelites stopped at Mount Sinai and built Las Vegas? So what if they stayed? What if Adama dies, their Moses dies, and there's no more spark plug? So they start putting all of their energy towards building this massive um, golden calf, as it were, this massive white elephant, which was a space colony with pleasure domes and gambling centers and business areas. And it was all about that, all about building a bigger machine. And they lost their sense of purpose. They lost their sense of wanting to find Earth. Uh, but, of course, those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And they... Um, of course, forget that the Cylons are out there, but the Cylons have come back. But this time, they're a little different and a little changed, a little more evolved, and it's 20 years later. And we were also doing, you know, when we had a female president, uh, we had uh, the decommissioning of the Galactica in the pilot episode, um, and they'd sort of gotten lazy, and they'd sort of forgotten what the past was, and the Cylons come back and do this devastating attack again a la Pearl Harbor, but also, this is pre-9-11, and the storyline was very similar to what happened on 9-11, and that was part of the reason we ended up shutting down, was after 9-11, no one could function, you know, including myself for a period of about uh, a month. We were, you know, uh, it was difficult to, to concentrate or to, to think that our little space show meant a whole lot of difference. 
Um, but eventually, you know what, we all, you know, picked ourselves up, brushed ourselves off, and we got back to work, and we said, hey, look, uh, we gotta, we got to keep working here and do our jobs. And that push, though, ended up influencing our scheduled start of um, principal photography for Galactic. Unfortunately, because um, Fox Features was um, starting to schedule X Men 2, there was this concern over Brian's availability and would he be available? How could he be in two places at one time? And Brian was left with a Sophie's Choice sort of situation where he had to choose one of his kids, and unfortunately, um, you know, Galactica um, lost out on that. But, uh, you know, Brian was going to stay on as, uh, as an exec producer and, you know, still uh, be there as, as one of the guiding forces on the show. But Fox all of a sudden started losing um, interest. Well, let's go back uh, just a second for, uh, and talk a little bit more about some of the new characters. We, we understand that Starbucks' daughter was going to be uh, a major character on the show. Yes, and actually, you know what, that was always in a state of flux, at, at least for me, um, because af after conversations with Dirk, um, and that was one thing which, you know, and I spoke to Richard and spoke to, to, to Herb about what they wanted to do with their characters, you know, I, I wasn't so sure on whether we were going to marry off in the final script, Starbuck or not. Um, originally, there was going to be a female but a, not a cigar-chomping version, more of a, um, uh, I guess the best analogy would sort of be Newt from, from Aliens All Grown Up. Um, definitely her, her, her father's daughter. Uh, but using that template of that character, again, tapping into a lot of what Anne did in the first series um, with Sheba, you know, that strong female, but still a very female character, not a guy... Um, you know, it, it, it couldn't, you couldn't, in other words, um, uh, just replace her with a male actor and nobody would notice. It was still a distinctly female character. Um, but after talking with Dirk, I, I actually started to move towards his thoughts on the character, which was making him Peter Pan and making him this guy who is now, you know, uh, just past 50 and who never maybe never got married, never settled down, never had um, the family, and might now be looking at those decisions of the past with a little bit of regret and a little bit of um, sadness, and then having um, Cassiopeia come back into his life and see the possibility of the what if, because she didn't wait around, and she went off and had the family and had the kids and had that thing which he could have had if he had been a little less Starbuck. <laughs> um, so that was a direction which I thought was really interesting for the, for the character to go. But yeah, we, one of, in, the, in the first draft of the script, we did have um, a character of Raina, which was uh, going to be Starbuck's daughter. And then we had the two sons, who would be the grandsons of Richard, um, of Boxy. And we did age up Boxy a bit. We made Boxy um, very JFK which was his early 40s, and this was really the first test by fire. Um, so he had, you know, uh, sons which, uh, again, were in their early 20s, and um, uh, a next generation definite feel to them. Now, I understand that using uh, characters and actors from the original series, despite the fact that Fox knew this was to be a continuation, was uh, a source of consternation with, with the network. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, <laughs> they were a little uh, taken aback by um, the fact that uh, you know we had uh, Starbuck in it. It was going to be Dirk, and uh, but you know what? That's the one thing where you know after making you know now with two movies a billion dollars for Fox, uh, a lot of times the studios learn to trust your instincts and sort of uh, go away with their own. Um, so yeah, it, the initial impression was that um, I think they were thinking more of a a sort of complete distancing from the original, um, and you know maybe referencing it, but not having actual characters continued on like uh, like Boomer or Starbuck or Apollo for that matter, because we did have Apollo in the pilot, uh, but um, and he was he was probably the most key character in the pilot but he didn't have a lot of screen time. 
Um, but I did let Richard know what the, the plans were for the character. And, um, and initially he was, he was a little reticent because um, it was much more of a, how do I say, a Darth Vader type journey. It was really about a story of him finding redemption and him coming back to the light side, uh, which again was going to play out over this, the, the series. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it would have been a, it would have been a definite challenge. And I think, you know, Richard is one of those actors who would have stepped right up and, and really both blown away the, the fans and the, and the critics, uh, with a performance that he could, uh, he could sink his teeth into. Well, when we talk about that subplot that Apollo was going to be involved in uh, using nanotechnology to uh, to you know, silenize uh, human colonials, uh, out in fandom, uh, uh, parallels are drawn with the Borg, and people say, oh, that's such a rip-off of the Borg idea. But I, I never felt that way. You want to defend yourself against that charge? Sure. I mean, look, I mean, it, it's, uh, I consider that a uh, compliment because I, I love the Borg. But the, the problem I had with the Borg was there was no personality to them. Um, you know, they were, it was a one-note situation. I think they were a great villain, but it was sort of, um, you know, it was like a hive mentality, and it wasn't going to be that with, um, with the Colonials. It was going to be much more symbolic of what I think the, the ultimate perception of something like communism would be. Um, and not the, you know, I mean, the, the absolute, you know, control by the state, the absolute um, abdication by the individual of free will in order to get the trains to run on time. But you still have your family, you still have um, your job, you still have your life, but your life, in a way, is not your own. So it's not a hive mentality uh, like the Borg were. It, it's much more of a... Um, I don't know. It's like a very, very dark version of Stepford. Um, I think would be the best way to put it. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was. You know, Stepford run by Il Duce, um, and uh, I think that is, you know, the, the complete sort of fascist state where it's all about order. And again, that was something I had given backstory to the original show, which wasn't there. Because, uh, you know, looking back, and I'm like, okay, you have um, the curious leader, but why is he there? Why does he look reptilian? Um, so I had decided to do, and I know he was, he was a Cylon, he was robotic in the original, but I was going to fudge that a bit, and say that he was the last of the reptilian Cylons, or there were very few reptilian Cylons left. So... It, by giving the, the backstory of the reptilian Cylons was that, that they created the mechanical Cylons in order to combat the humans. This was now their weapon. This was their thing. They didn't have to risk their lives anymore. They, they had a completely uh, mechanical um, army, and they would devastate humanity with it. But in the programming for that, um, there was a flaw, and there was a glitch, that um, it was about their need to... Um, bring order to the universe. But in the robotics, uh, in, the, in this robotic Cylons programming, in order to bring order to the universe, they needed to destroy not only humanity, but they needed to destroy anything that had a free will. So in order to do that, they needed to turn against their masters. So that is why they turned against the reptilian Cylons. And the reptilian Cylons were devastated by this. And it actually took the, the robotic Cylons focus away from the humans as they were devastating their creators to the point where they are now, um, there's very few reptilian Cylons left. And the only way they can do an end around or, or, or circumvent the programming on this, this annihilation that will happen to them is for them to undergo a procedure through nanotechnology which will rewrite their brain, their free will, their DNA, so that they no longer um, have that. So in order to survive, they give up their free will. That was how we were, uh, uh, we were going to bring back um, in or introduce human Cylons into our world, was after this great uh, devastation and they find out, you know, they pull out the old 
uh, maps and they say, okay, Earth, this is where we should have been going all along. But they discover that they were going in the wrong direction. And Earth is back through the heart of darkness. They actually have to go back through the colonies and back through um, the people they left behind. So it's that journey back into the heart of darkness. How are you going to reconcile the uh, going in the wrong direction with the uh, ship of lights having uh, having basically given them the coordinates to Earth? Um, th actually, that was going to also bring... Uh, there was going to be a continuation with the ship of lights and actually with Jane's character coming back into the mix. Um, and you actually, we actually find out that there's a larger battle going on and that sometimes... The, um, angelic beings are not what they appear to be. There can be some other forces disguised as angelic beings. Oh, my heart's breaking as I'm hearing this. Um, again, that was, um, you know, and, and eventually where, you know, the series was going to go was it was going to be a, a symbolic thing, which was about the larger battle between the Ibley-type forces and um, the lightship forces. And it's the humans and the Cylons all talking in terms of free will and and um, and choice and then those things which either make us human or not human um, and that was the journey again thematically we're going to step into so that was going to basically uh, comprise the, the main plot elements of, of at least the first season yeah that was going to be um, plot elements uh, again that we're going to go through the series uh, but Jane's character we were going to reintroduce um, or at least this was, a, was an idea that I had uh, to be the one to sort of um, turn Richard's character to turn Apollo back from his programming from the dark side from giving up that which made him human um, it was his rebirth his sort of ability to have a second chance so, um, and I think that would have been whether you were a fan of the uh, original show you would have gotten something completely on another level out of it but if you were just stepping into it you would have come to care about the characters unto themselves and realize that um, you know love conquers all as it were well it sounds like we would have probably seen fewer uh, traditional space battles it, it sounds like there would have been more communication b between the Cylons and, and the Colonials than just sh a shoot em up every week um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I think we, there was going to be definitely, you know, shoot em, shoot em ups each week, but it was going to be also saying something more about the human condition and talking more in terms of, um, you know, deeper issues that, uh, again, thematically, the original show had tapped into. Um, and those were the strongest episodes of the original show, was when they talked about uh, the more spiritual sides and the more mythic sides of, of storytelling. Oh. And the values of hope and family and courage above adversity. Absolutely, and and you know that was you know and one of the, the great storylines we had was actually you know, um, Boxy or Orin was uh, going to become obsessed with getting his father back, even at the point where he was willing to um, he, he was starting to uh, put the the fleet in danger uh, because he was obsessed with you know regaining this thing which he had lost twenty years earlier. And do you feel that there's uh, that there is a place for that with the 21st century audience? I mean, I, I know that's something I'd like to see, but but overall, do you do you, do you know? I I absolutely I absolutely think with the 21st century audience, there is um, you know when you look at the success, uh, I mean, and I'm talking about the big successes of Hollywood. Um, it is the more pop culture, the more you know inclusive uh, science fiction like Star Wars, like Harry Potter, um, you know, like Spider-Man, which, again, is not only about what's cool to the, you know, to the 18-year-old um, or the 38-year-old, but what's, what's cool on a level when you're 8 or 18 or 38 or 88 um, and not trying just to target. And, I'm, look, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a science fiction fan, but... The show we were going to be doing was not only for science fiction fans, but for people who were not science fiction fans and who just liked good, good stories. Well, let's talk a little bit about the look and feel of the show. There's, and there's a lot of folks out there who can't seem to grasp the concept that a continuation would have meant updating. I mean, the original show still gets a lot of what I see as 
unfair criticism for feathered hair, disco, capes and boots, and, you know, it, to me that's like criticizing I Love Lucy for being shot in black and white. Yeah. What, what steps had you taken with your show to meet the challenge of bringing the look and feel of Battlestar Galactica into the 21st century while uh, maintaining a link to the original? Uh, again, it was, it was staying true to a lot of the wonderful uh, production design staying true to the actors, staying true to the spirit of, you know, what Boomer was or what Apollo was or, you know, the memory of Adama uh, and keeping true to the ship. You know, the Galactica we had, um, the only modification, and it was only one that I had requested, um, was to put big guns on it. You know, the, that was the one thing which, looking back, I'm like, the Galactica should have some big old, you know, star blazer <laughs> type guns on it so that it could hold its own instead of those little rail guns which went back and forth along the launch base. Um, but it was, it was a ship that was 25 years older and hadn't, other than having some big guns put on it, had not seen a lot of uh, love and care in about 20 years. So it was starting to rust out and mothball a bit. Um, and also the, the, the use of the, um, you know, the, one of the things that I really loved about the show um, which I know has been derided as of late, was the whole Chariots of the Gods tie-in, um, which was, you know, there are those who believe, you know, um, that life here started out there. And it was tying in and, you know, pulling information, and we had a massive um, style guide, which, again, took Egyptian and Aztec and Mayan and um, Babylonian and Sumerian and Chinese and all of these great uh, historic cultures and melded them into one. Um, so there would be hints at that, and still keeping the the Egyptian, uh, you know, motif on the um, on the, the Viper uh, helmets and, and and the uniforms, and you know, as far as capes go, um, there probably would have been capes and formal, like it would have been like a dress uniform thing. Uh, but as far as you know, everyday cape use, um, that was something that would have probably gone uh, a little bit to the side. Um, but again, still trained, staying true to the to the colors they had and using those icons of the of the, the dark blues and, and the browns and the tans and the and you know because it, it worked so well and there was a reason that it worked so well. Well, we saw the uh, global effects designs uh, for the the new Cylon Centurions and uh, they, they looked uh, phenomenal. Uh, it still brings a tear to my eye. Uh, obviously, uh, on on the Sci Fi Channel series now, we see a lot more human Cylons than mechanical Cylons. Would that have been yeah. the case on your show? And would that have been uh, an, an economic thing? Yeah, no, I, I think we were actually building the suits. Um, they're all CG, um, so that was the difference that we were going to do and. Um, and in the budget we had, um, you know, we had a, a good chunk of change set aside to build enough of those Cylon suits. Um, and one of the, 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 the real great ideas that Brian had was to, you know, and we all agreed we wanted to bring the, the Cylons back as, as robots, um, and not reveal that. And the only reveal we had that there were human Cylons was in the last shot of our original, um, pilot, um, which was you hear this voice sort of giving orders to the mechanical Cylons throughout the pilot. And then um, in the last shot, you're hearing this voice again, and we go in through, the, through space, through the mist, and we, for the first time we actually see the planet uh, Cylon. And we go in, and this voice is getting louder and clearer, and you, you zoom in, and then you see, oh, my God, these are not robots giving these orders. These are humans and you come across this table in the shadows and you see these faces. You're literally living a fan's dream, coming so close to executive producing a show that meant this much to you personally, to, to steer the course of what you considered at the time to be the third biggest franchise, you know, a show that you were so passionate about, and then to have it, you know, fall apart and taken away. What, how did that feel? Well, you know, I, I think it's, it felt exactly as, as the fans felt. Um, you know, and, and, and not to take away anything from the success uh, of the, the current version. Because, you know, again, I hold no ill will, and I think David Icke and, and Ron Moore um, have done a great job with this show. It's, it's not the show I would have done or, or the show Brian would have done. Um, and not, not to speak for Brian, but it's not the show we were planning on doing. Um, but, you know, they got it done. They got it on the air, and that was where, uh, that was where the, the studio put their bet behind. And, um, and I understand that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's become a tremendous critical success for them. And, you know, there's a lot of elements and tone in that show, which um, was very similar 
to what we were going to do. The only thing I'd say was different was that we were doing, as opposed to a hard sci-fi show, we were going to do a more pop culture sci-fi show. But look, that's uh, that's where my love is. My love is, you know, I respect hard science fiction, uh, but if it's a choice between uh, hard science fiction and a, a good um, pop sci-fi movie, um, that's where my heart is, you know, and I can't be false to that. I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. I love... Galactica, um, you know, I, look, I love X Men. X Men was a movie I wanted to do since I was twelve years old. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of in that sort of sensibility. You know, I respect movies like Minority Report or AI or the harder science fiction films, but it's not my cup of tea. You talked a little bit earlier about uh, Firefly, and uh, of course, Firefly turned out to be a really good show that uh, Fox, from all appearances, completely bungled with poor promotion, uh, frequent preemption, and no tolerance for for building an audience. In in retrospect, uh, do you have any concern that Battlestar would have been given the the same kind of treatment? You know, I I don't, I actually think we probably would have had uh, an ace up our sleeve that Joss didn't have which was the name recognition. Um, you know, and, and Joss is, you know, uh, he's a great guy. I actually, you know, visited him on the set of, uh, of Serenity because uh, I know Lonnie Peristeer, who ended up doing the effects for Galactica, because I was talking to bring, uh, bringing Lonnie on back in uh, 2000, 2001 uh, with Zoic, which um, and Lonnie did all the effects for Angel and Buffy and did an amazing job on, uh, on Firefly. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I think there would have been battles. I think there is a lack of understanding on the network side of what makes a genre show work. I think there, it's also, a, 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 in Hollywood, it, it's sort of a rule. Nobody wants to be first, but everybody wants to be second. So if, you know, you have a 90210 which hits, then, you know, everyone's going to come out with their Melrose Place or whatever, which is going to follow in its footsteps and be similar and try and just capture that. I'm sure this season we're going to see a lot of Desperate Housewives uh, knockoffs, which are just going to feel, geez, that's sort of, which is, you know, which is good and it's bad because it means that, okay, the, there was a success and something changed the, the, the tone of the industry, um, but now everyone's trying to copycat it. Uh, and I think with, you know, when dealing with Fox, um, you know, and Gail Berman was great, and you know, it was uh, it was a it was a it was a great marriage while it lasted, and um, you know, it would have been the perfect network. If, if somebody said which network do you want to be on, um, you know, it would have been a toss up between ABC and Fox. Um, but I was glad we were at Fox because it was also a younger, hipper, and they got that, and you know, they were really behind the show. And unfortunately, you know, when 9-11 happened, um, and then, you know, with us losing Brian, um, and Fox Network fought for to keep Brian on board. Uh, but it was, uh, it was, you know, a decision that was handed, up, handed down from uh, higher above. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the future of, of Galactica as, as relates to the original series. Uh, last month, Glenn Larson made a statement at a convention in England that he planned to have a Battlestar movie on the big screen within a year and a half. You know, Now, a lot of fans, we, we've heard this from Glenn before, so we were a little skeptical. So the, yeah. the money question is, to your knowledge, what, if any, rights does Glenn have in regards to producing a Battlestar project, uh, TV or feature film? You know, I, I would have to, you know, I, I can't speak for Glenn on that. Uh, part um, but you know it, it's I, I still think there's life in a um, you know in the old series or continuation of the old series while the new series is going on I think it is possible to do both um, and actually I presented to uh, David Kissinger uh, when he was still at um, Universal uh, I had spoken with friends over at Cartoon Network and uh, they wanted to uh, um because I've been trying, okay, how can I get this story out there, and, and how can I continue this? And so I said, you know what, what about as an animated thing? And Cartoon Network really um, liked the idea a lot. So I went to Universal, and I said, look, is this a possibility? I think we can get Cartoon Network on board. Um, you know, it's a brand for them. You can have, um, you know, the new Galactica, which is, again, like the next generation, as we're doing classic Galactica with, you know, our Kirk and Spock, you can do Picard and, um, and Riker. And 
uh, Kissinger said, let me think about it. And about two weeks later, um, he came back and he said, look, we don't want to confuse the brand, um, which I, I did understand and I also didn't understand um, because the turnaround on an animated series would have been probably about uh, two years. Um, but uh, the decision from Universal was no, they don't want to do an animated series. Uh, are these the yeah. same people that have two Stargates on and saw that uh, there was always two Star Trek series on at the same time? <laughs> You know, it's uh, I, I I wish I could understand the reasoning and you know try to convince the the powers of that be. Unfortunately, it's not my decision. You know, it's uh, look creatively. I, you know, you put me in the in in charge of the show. I'll know where to take it. I'll know where to you know not only make fans happy but make a whole new generation of fans. But um, as far as the uh, <laughs> trying to figure out the psychology of studio decisions. That is something which has baffled uh, every creative person on the planet for for a hundred years. Now, the animated series uh, would have picked up right after the Hand of God, and would not have been set twenty five years later. No, it still would have been set twenty five years later. Um, you know, and I would have gone back to Brian and, and and Dan and Billy, and you know, hopefully regroup. But I didn't make any of those phone calls because it wasn't. I didn't get the thumbs up from Kissinger in order to start that. But, uh, you know, nothing would have been more fun uh, for me than to, to get back in that Galactica sandbox with, uh, with Brian and, uh, and then making that phone call to Dan and Billy to get him back on board. Well, fans have come together to, to try to, you know, in the wake of the CFF ads, uh, what can we do now? And the, uh, the idea of a direct-to-DVD feature has come up. How, how do you feel about that as, as a route for bringing the original Battlestar back? You know, it's uh, it's definitely a route, um, you know, and I'm definitely in communication with Glenn as far as, you know, trying to figure out how to, um, you know, get uh, get the old girl up and going. Um, and also make it, you know, the, the one thing which I think, you know, I don't want to say short-sighted, but the, the tone of the new show, which is, you know, is its own tone and, and works on its own, but doesn't capture what's, I think uh, is the possibilities also again to get in the younger audience, to get in the family audience, and therefore expand for Universal. Um, you know, uh, one of the, the, the great uh, cash machines because that's what they understand. You know, it's, it's all about how do we um, bring money into to the corporation? How do we how do we keep those quarterly numbers up? And that would be through merchandising. And you know, that's one of the, the, the weapons I could bring to the table saying, look, you can get merchandising um, that would be, you know, Toys R Us friendly. <laughs> um, so you have the ships and the action figures and all of those things and still have an intelligent show. Uh, you know, it's the old Walt Disney philosophy. He, when asked, he said, why do you make kids' movies? He said, I don't make kids' movies. I make movies for adults that children can go see. Well, I've been lucky enough to uh, catch some of the uh, the episodes of the of the new version of Doctor Who that the BBC uh, put out this past year, and I got to say, if you want a textbook on how to uh, bring back a property that some would consider cheesy and make it relevant to today's audience while maintaining truth to it, that's I mean, it's a textbook example right there. I know, yeah, I know in our gut and my gut that uh, we had that uh, formula down a hundred percent, and uh, you know the success that we had with something like X Men and translating that to the big screen um, successfully would have, um, in, I know 100%, uh, would have worked with uh, our version of Galactica. Well, you'd mentioned you'd been talking uh, with Glenn. Now, the rumors that came out after Galacticon was that there was kind of a stonewall, that Glenn wanted to do a Pegasus movie and you wanted to do a Galactica movie. Was, was that ever true, and is that still a consideration uh, as far as you working with Glenn? Yeah, I, I think there are, um, you know, there are differences um, on the, the takes that we would have. Uh, but, you know, that's part of the creative process, and I would expect that, you know, and I, I would expect, look, if, if he can convince me of something or if I can convince him of something. Um, but I, for me, I wouldn't be interested in doing a Pegasus movie. I wouldn't be interested in doing anything but Galactica. And that is, um, you know, something which... Um, you know, again, with my schedule and how busy I am, it's uh, it's something which um, you know I'd be willing to throw uh, my energy and time behind, but um, only if uh, only if it was Galactica. So that that was one of my next questions. It's been you know uh, we, we we keep hearing about how full Tom DeSanto's plate is, but uh, you're saying if the opportunity came along, you'd make room on the plate. 
Absolutely, you know, it, and it's it's not like the uh, the work hasn't been done. You know, <laughs> there's a whole, um, you know, you're, you're you're also talking to somebody who mapped out a five year battle plan for the series. So it was, you know, including story. And look, if we went there or not, who knows? Um, you know, but at least there was a larger story that we were trying to achieve. Um, so yeah, a lot of that work and a lot of that thought process has gone been done and gone through. Uh, right now, it's you know, look, it, it, it's. Uh, it's not my decision, and ultimately, at the end of the day, that's the. If it was my decision, you know, it would have been done in uh, in 2001, and we would have started shooting um, back then. Um, and I would have, you know, absolutely 100%. We, you know, we could have done both. There was there, you know, the schedule actually turned out where we could have shot Galactica, and we could have shot um, X Men Two, and still kept the schedules in order. But. Um, but yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's it's one of those things where it's I don't control the rights. It's um, you know, it's a uh, Glenn has the film rights and, and Universal has the TV rights. So uh, it's it's one of those situations where uh, you know if if either of them are ready and and want to get in the trenches, then uh, they know where to find me. What uh, what can we fans do to help? Is is there anything we can do to help? You know, and 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 you know, one of the reasons. Um, you know, and, and, and actually the reason that, um, you know, I, I really want to do this interview with you was the fact that I wanted to, um, you know, give something back to the fans. Because, you know, one, I'm a fan, and I know how frustrating it can be when you're seeing things and you're not getting the information. And, and you know, it's, it's my way of saying thank you. You know, that, um, you know, there was, um, there was a lot of... Uh, thought and energy and a lot of, um, you know, we had sets being built, but unfortunately it just didn't become a reality. Uh, but yeah, as far as what the fans can do now, um, that's a great question. I wish I wish I had an answer. Uh, but uh, I think it's, it's sort of one of those situations where until there's some movement either from on the studio side or um, with Glenn deciding that... Um, uh, you know, he wants to move forward with a feature, then that would be uh, that would be the time. And it's one of those situations where that could happen tomorrow, or it might ha not happen for five years. It might. You know, it's um, it's it's one of those things where it absolutely one could go one way or the other. But you've not given up hope. Uh, no, never give up. You know, never surrender. I'll be seventy-five, and if this story still isn't done. Um, I'll still be fighting to get, uh, you know, at least at least so it's out there. At least so it's uh, part of the mythology, and you know, that's the that, that's the joy of my job is I'm getting, you know, all my action figures are real now, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, if if somebody would have told me when I was ten that um, you know you you would uh, have the opportunity even if it didn't go to air to you know, work with uh, uh, Dirk Benedict or Richard Hatch or, or become friends with these people um, or Herb, um, you know, wow, I would have, you know, and they're all great people. They really are. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of not great people in this business, but, uh, uh, you know, everyone I've met uh, with Galactica from Glenn through, through the cast, um, through Ron and, and David Icke, you know, they've all been stand-up guys and uh, I wish everybody well. And you know, it's uh, it's it's just trying to hopefully one day have um, have the current Galactica and maybe classic going at the same time. Is the fact that you haven't given up hope one of the reasons that we've not seen uh, the script for your pilot in another form, like a novel or a graphic novel or a comic book series? Well, uh, uh, one reason is um, you know, again, it's it's universal. Um, needing to say, look, you guys, you know, our Galactica is established. We don't feel threatened, or we don't feel that there's going to be a, um, a sense of the the, the, the fanship getting convoluted by an animated series. And you know, look, if they ever said that, um, you know, I, I think uh, we'd have a pretty good chance of getting a, an animated series on the air. But again, that's that's a Universal Studios decision on a larger scale. Um, and the, the thing that Universal has to realize is that this is one of those um, situations where it's, it's <laughs> the real money is, is in the, again, the, the, the DVDs that could be sold and in the merchandising and in the models and all of those things which um, are, have limited appeal because of the harder, more adult nature of the new show. 
You've been very generous with your time, Tom. Uh, uh, very quickly, I know that uh, you're, you're working on Transformers. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit uh, about what's going on with that? Um, yeah, just uh, that we've announced the um, the uh, release date, which is 747, which is um, July 407. So um, we had a big presentation uh, down at Comic Con uh, with a big 18 wheeler truck and uh, uh, the announcement of the, the date. So yeah, it's uh, no, that, that that's another another situation where my action figures have become real. Um, and yeah, it, you know, again, it, the thing with Transformers, it will be. You know, accessible. Again, you'll find it cool if you're eight or eighteen or thirty-eight, um, and if you're a fan of that material, um, you will leave the theater very happy. And if you're not, um, then you will also leave a fan. So it's the same thing as X-Men. You know, a lot of people went into X-Men um, who didn't know anything about uh, characters named Wolverine or or Professor Xavier or Magneto. Um, and left with an appreciation of those characters, those relationships, and, uh, and that mythology. Well, I know that all of us uh, original series fans are planning to go see Transformers uh, 12, 11 times, uh, you know, because we'd like you to make another billion for the studio. So, you know, if, if Peter Jackson can, you know, walk in and say, I want to do King Kong and get a green light, we're, you know, we're hoping Transformers will put you in that place where you can walk in and say, I want to do Galactica, and they say, Tom, do whatever you want. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Tom DeSanto. If you did, please give a like and subscribe to the channel. There will be more content coming up soon, and if you wish to know more, click on the notification button to receive announcements ahead of time. Thanks for tuning in. Everybody have a great and productive day.